Hello, this is a mini lecture. We're going to be looking at uh, Rome and some aspects that your textbook didn't go into uh, very much detail, and I want to extend on that a little bit. Um, first of all, we're going to be looking at uh, the role of the army in Rome. Rome would have never have been as successful as it had been um, without the army. And the peace of Rome, of the Roman Empire, depended on the army, uh, as well as the security of the princeps. Uh, and at this time, the princeps were looking at Augustus, um, the primarily, uh, though primarily responsible for guarding the frontiers of the empire, the army was also used to maintain domestic order within its various provinces throughout the empire. Also, the army played an important social role. It was an important um, uh, agency for upward mobility for both officers and recruits. Uh, the Roman army provided uh, for um, Romanization out in the provinces. Uh, wherever the legions were stationed, they brought with them Roman culture. It brought their language, uh, their traditions, their various religions, uh, and the colonies of veterans are going to prove especially valuable in Romanizing the provinces. It's going to bring Roman law and Latin. Uh, that was the language that the Roman legionnaires spoke. Um, after the Battle of Actium in 31 uh, BCE, um, of course, Augustus prevailed, defeated Mark Antony and Cleopatra. He's now the princeps, the first citizen of Rome. Uh, Augustus reduced the size of the army. He considered it larger than the empire needed, as well as too expensive to maintain. Uh, he established a standing army of 28 legions. So the Roman Empire has an army of about 150,000 men. Certainly not large either by modern standards or in terms of the size of the empire itself. Uh, it's estimated that the population of the entire Roman Empire was probably close to 50 million. Um, Roman legionnaires, uh, they served 20 years. They were recruited only from the citizenry of Rome. You had to be a Roman citizen. And under uh, the time of Augustus, those citizens are largely coming from Italy. Uh, so Augustus also maintained a large contingent auxiliary force. Uh, these various forces, he enlisted uh, those soldiers uh, from the subject peoples. Um, the auxiliary forces, they served as both light armed troops and cavalry. They were commanded by Roman officers as well as several tribal leaders like uh, the German Arminius. Um, during the rule of Augustus, um, the auxiliaries numbered around 130,000 men and they were recruited from non-citizens. They served for 24 years. After their service of 24 years, that soldier, along with his family, received citizenship after their terms of service. Uh, Augustus was also responsible for establishing the Praetorian Guard. Uh, there was nine cohorts of these elite troops, roughly about 9,000 men, and they had the important task of guarding the person of the princeps. Um, they were recruited from Roman citizens in Italy. They served 16 years, and if you were going to be in the army, you wanted to be a Praetorian Guard because you're going to be stationed in Rome. And that's where you want to be. Eventually, the Praetorian Guard, as well as the Roman army, are going to play an important role in making and deposing emperors. Now, Augustus, too, uh, was also uh, concerned about um, Roman society. Um, and uh, Roman society was characterized by a system of social stratification um, inherited from the people, from the republic in which Roman citizens were divided into three basic classes. You had the senatorial class, the equestrian, and then the lower classes. Um, each class had its own functions and opportunities, but the system wasn't completely rigid. There was possibilities for mobility uh, from one group to another. So when Augustus becomes princeps, he had accepted the senatorial order as a ruling class for the empire. Uh, senators, they filled those chief magistries of the Roman government. 
they held the most important military posts. They governed the provinces. So they are the consuls, they are the praetors, and the proconsuls, and the propraetors. Um, they're going to be serving as, uh, like I said, governors in the provinces. One needed to possess property worth a million sesterces um, to belong to the senatorial order. Now, to give you an idea about um, what the value of a sesterce is, um, an unskilled labor in Rome received three sesterces a day. Uh, a Roman legionnaire, member of the army, received 900 sesterces a year in pay. So when Augustus took charge, the Senate had over a thousand members, and Augustus revised the senatorial list and he reduced it to 600 men. Um, he also added new men from wealthy families throughout in Italy onto that senatorial list. So overall, Augustus was successful in winning the support of the senatorial class for his new order. Um, the equestrian order. The equestrian order was open to all Roman citizens of good standing who possessed property valued at 400,000 sesterces. Now, the equestrians, they too, could now hold military and governmental offices, but the positions open to them were less important than those held by the senatorial order. Uh, at the end of his career, an equestrian might be rewarded by membership in the senatorial uh, order. Uh, those citizens not of the senatorial or equestrian orders belong to the lower classes, and it's the lower classes who obviously constituted the overwhelming majority of the free citizens. Uh, many of these people uh, were provided with free grain and public spectacles, and that's to keep them from creating disturbances. Nevertheless, by gaining wealth and serving as lower officers in the Roman legions, it was sometimes possible for them to advance to the uh, equestrian order. Now, Augustus also, he was concerned about um, uh, uh, Roman morals, uh, social reform. He believed that the morals had been corrupted during the late Republic, so that's going to lead him to initiate social legislation to try to arrest decline. Uh, Augustus believed that increased luxury had undermined traditional Roman frugality and simplicity and it caused a decline in morals and that was evidenced in uh, it was very easy to get a divorce in Rome you had a falling birth rate among the upper classes um, and lax behavior that manifested in these uh, parties uh, sometimes orgies and there was also love affairs of prominent Romans with fashionable women and elegant boys. So uh, Augustus could initiate some new social legislation to try to halt that. Uh, he hoped to restore respectability to the upper classes and reverse the, the, the declining birth rate as well. So uh, expenditures for feasts were limited. Uh, other laws made adultery a criminal, uh, criminal offense. In fact, Augustus proved how serious he was about this. Uh, his own beloved daughter Julia was exiled for adultery. And that's a clear indication that Augustus was very serious about his attempts to control the sexual behavior of Rome's upper classes. Now, this didn't mean that he followed uh, these laws. Uh, well, Augustus was known to have a few affairs. Um, Augustus also revised the tax laws to penalize bachelors, widowers, and married persons who had fewer than three children. Um, there was no uh, serious opposition to Augustus' choice for his stepson Tiberius as his successor. Um, Tiberius was not Augustus's first choice, but he managed to outlive the other relatives whom Augustus would have preferred. And it's um, some argument that maybe Augustus' wife, who was Tiberius's mother, um, may have um, had something to do with uh, some of Augustus's male relatives not surviving. Um, so the designation of a family member as princeps 
that's tantamount, tantamount to accepting the principle of dynastic rule. That's hardly appropriate to the image of Augustus. He tried to cultivate the princeps as only the first citizen of the state, but by his actions, Augustus established what's known as the Julio-Claudian dynasty. So the next four rulers, the Julio-Claudian rulers, were related either to Augustus's own family or to that of his wife, Livia. Um, the Julian Claudian rulers, uh, they varied greatly in ability. Uh, Tiberius is the first, ruled from 14 to 37 um, CEE, Common Era. Uh, he was a competent general, able administrator. He tried initially to involve the Senate in government. Then you've got Caligula. He was the grandnephew of Tiberius and great grandson of Augustus. Um, his behavior became extremely erratic. Um, probably due to mental instability. And then there's Claudius, ruled from 41 to 54. Uh, he'd been mistreated by his family because of a physical do disability due to partial paralysis, paralysis. This may have been one of the reasons why he survived some of his relatives. Um, because of his disability, they equated that, that he was also um, not mentally intelligent. And he was. He was extremely intelligent. Um, so uh, he was well-educated proved to be a competent administrator and he's followed by Nero, the last of the Julio-Claudians. He ruled from 54 to 68. He was only 16 when he came to power, but uh, his interest in the arts it caused him to neglect affairs of states, especially the military. Um, and that's going to prove to be his undoing. Uh, undoing. So as the Julian claudian successors of Augustus began to behave openly like real rulers rather than first citizens of the state. The opportunity for arbitrary and corrupt acts increased. Uh, Caligula became mentally unbalanced. Um, he wanted to be hailed as a god. Um, he even, um, so the stories go, appointed his favorite horse as a senator and the uh, horse voted. <laughs> Don't know quite how that was done, but it did. Um, and he had neglected affairs of the state while uh, indulging in his uh, passions and um, yeah, he was insane by the end of his rule. Nero freely eliminated people he wanted out of the way, including his own mother, um, whom he had murdered. Uh, his mother was um, Julia Agrippa Pina. Um, she was Claudius's second wife. She was also Caligula's sister and Claudius's niece. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so. So the senators, um, they were unable to oppose some of these excesses. Only the Praetorian Guard, which had been established by Augustus, seemed capable of interfering with these rulers. But, and they did so in a manner that did not bode well for future stability of Rome. Um, the Praetorian Guard hated Caligula. Uh, and they hatched a plot and assassinated him uh, before he had ruled for four complete years. And then they realized, well, we've got we've to get an emperor, another Julio-Claudian emperor, because that's our job, to guard the emperor and to, you know, we get to stay in Rome. So they choose Claudius. They found him actually hiding. They, Claudius thought they were going to kill him too. Uh, he was the uncle of Caligula. So he became the next emperor and he forced the Senate to confirm their act, thereby demonstrating the power of the military units stationed around Rome. Uh, and then the downfall of the Julio-Claudian dynasty that came during the reign of Nero. Um, the first part of his reign was pretty successful. He was young, he worked hard, uh, his tutor uh, helped him, and it gave the empire a sound government. But his tutor Seneca got really disgusted with Nero because he got tired of his duties, began to pursue other interests including singing, acting, horse racing, and he's a young man. There's going to be sexual activities uh, that he's going to be interested in. After Seneca resigned uh, in 62, Nero's rule deteriorated. Um, he was obsessed with singing and acting in public, and the senatorial class found that quite ridiculous. Um, and at the same time, Nero's also executing a number of prominent figures, including a popular general. He accused him of treason. His actions is going to lead to a conspiracy, not by the Praetorian Guard this time, 
but by uh, the Roman legions themselves. Um, Galba, he was a governor of one of the Spanish provinces, rose in revolt and he secured the Principate for himself. Nero, he's abandoned by his guards, uh, the army is approaching and he chose to commit suicide by stabbing himself in the throat and allegedly his final words was quote, what an artist the world is losing in me end quote so Galba um, he accepts that he's accepted by the other provincial armies um, I'm sorry he's not accepted by some of the other provincial armies and the result is this civil war in the year 69 It's known as the year of the four emperors finally Vespasian commander of the legions in the east he's going to establish himself as sole ruler and his family is is creating a new dynasty known as the Flavians uh, the significance of the year 69 was summed up precisely by Tacitus he's a Roman historian and he stated that a well-hidden secret of the Principate has been revealed it was possible it seemed for an emperor to be chosen outside of Rome end quote of course he's chosen by members of the Roman army now Many historians see what's known as the Pax Romana, which is this period of prosperity that began with Augustus. Because you got to remember, Augustus ended those civil wars that was generated as a result of the First Triumvirate and Second Triumvirate. And you had a few little glitches, but the Romans, they're not at civil war. So they are, of course, still having conflicts in the provinces, but this period is known as the Pax Romana, period of peace. And it engendered, um, as this Pax Romana, this chief benefits of Roman rule during the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. And these benefits were especially notable, noticeable during the reigns of what's they were referred to as the five so-called good emperors. These rulers, they treated the ruling classes with respect. They cooperated with the Senate. They ended arbitrary execute executions and they maintained peace in the empire and supported domestic policies that was generally beneficial to the empire uh, the five good emperors they extended the scope of imperial administration to areas that were previously untouched by the imperial government um, Nerva introduced and Trajan implemented the institutions called Alimente uh, this Alimente Terry program it provided state funds to assist poor parents in raising and educating children. And now the emperors were not motivated simply by benevolence since they believed that such a, that this kind of assistance it would materially aid in creating a larger pool of young men in Italy eligible for mil, uh, military service. Um, the five good emperors were widely praised by their subjects for their extensive building programs. Trajan and Hadrian uh, were especially active in construction uh, constructing uh, public works like the aqueducts, um, bridges, roads, harbor facilities. Hadrian built a wall uh, up in um, England um, and that was to keep uh, up in the north in what what's now known as Scotland there was a tribal group known as the Picts P -I -C -T -S. and uh, the wall was built to keep the Picts uh, north of that wall and it, although these building projects they provide jobs uh, so people they're prospering as a result of this um, at the center of this colossal Roman Empire was the ancient city of Rome uh, and it was truly a capital city Rome had the largest population of any, any city in the Empire it's estimated that its population was close to one million by the time of Augustus uh, and that would not have been possible without the aqueducts. That aqueducts it brought fresh water in, and also they had uh, the sewage system. That sewage system that flushed waste away. It kept it um, the city uh, healthier. There's no way a city could have of, of a million people could be uh, remain healthy without water coming in, fresh water. Uh, for anyone with ambitions, Rome that was the place to be. It was a magnet for many people, and it was extremely cosmopolitan. Nationalities from all over the empire resided there, with entire sections of the city inhabited by specific groups, such as the Greeks are in one area and the Syrians are in another. Um, 
Rome was no doubt an overcrowded and noisy city, and because of the congestion, cart and wagon traffic were banned from the streets during the day. Um, the noise from the resulting vehicular movement at night uh, often made sleep difficult. Um, evening pedestrian travel was dangerous. Although Augustus had organized a police force, lone travelers might be assaulted, robbed, and soaked by filth uh, thrown out from the upper story windows of Rome's massive apartment buildings. Uh, there was an enormous gulf that existed between the rich and the poor in the city of Rome. Uh, while the rich had comfortable villas, usually they were enclosed and they would even uh, have uh, water coming directly to their villa, their own private water from an aqueduct. Um, the poor, um, not quite so for fortunate, they lived in an apartment block called Insule, which might be six stories high. It was constructed of concrete. Uh, they were often poorly built and not infrequently collapsed. Uh, the use of wooden beams in the floors and movable stoves, torches, candles, and lamps within the rooms. They used that for heat, light, for cooking, and made uh, the danger of fire a constant companion. Uh, once started, fires were extremely difficult to put out. Uh, the famous fire in 64, uh, which Nero was blamed for, uh, but he found a scapegoat. He, he, he accused the Christians of the fire. Uh, devastated a good part of the city. Besides the hazards of collapse and fire, living conditions were miserable. You had high rents. It forced entire families into one room. Uh, of course, there's no plumbing. There's no central heating. Uh, conditions were so uncomfortable that poor Romans spent most of their time outdoors on the streets. Uh, fortunately for those people, um, Rome boasted public buildings unequaled anywhere in the empire. Their temples, markets, their baths, theaters, arches, governmental buildings, amphitheaters gave parts of the city an appearance of grandeur and magnificence. But you could go a little ways away and you could see also some really poor living conditions. Um, Though the center of a great empire, Rome was also a great parasite. Uh, beginning with Augustus, uh, the emperors accepted responsibility for providing food for their urban population, uh, with about 200,000 people receiving free grain. It was known as the grain dole. Rome needed about 6 million sacks of grain a year and imported large quantities from its African and Egyptian provinces to meet those requirements. Even with free grain, conditions were grim for the poor. Uh, early in the 2nd century CE, uh, a common doctor, a Roman doctor claimed that rickets was common among the city's children. Um, in addition to food and uh, the entertainment was also provided on a grand scale for the inhabitants of Rome. Uh, this was referred to as bread and circuses. Um, the emperor and other state officials, they provided public spectacles as part of the great festivals. Most of them were religious in origin. They, celebrate, they were celebrated by the state. More than a hundred days a year were given over to these public holidays, and these festivals included three major types of entertainment. At the Circus Maximus, you had uh, horse and chariot races. That attracted hundreds of thousands of people. You also had dramatic and other performances that were held in theaters, but the most famous of all the public spectacles were the gladiator shows. They were the most famous. Um, the gladiator shows were an integral part of Roman society. They took place in amphitheaters. Uh, the first amphitheater, the first permanent one, was constructed in Rome in 29 BCE. Uh, perhaps the most famous was the Flavian Amphitheater. It's called the Colosseum. And that was constructed at Rome under Vespasian and his son Titus. And it was to seat 50,000 people. Uh, amphitheaters not limited to the city of Rome, but were constructed throughout the empire. In Tunisia alone, which was only part of the Roman province of Africa, there were more than 20 amphitheaters. Uh, they varied greatly in size, with capacities ranging from a few thousand spectators to tens of thousands. Um, 
Considerable resources and ingenuity went into building them, especially the arrangements for moving uh, the wild animals efficiently into the arena. In most cities and towns, amphitheaters came to be the biggest buildings, rivaled only by the circuses for races and the public baths. Um, and as we, we shall see repeatedly in the course of Western civilization, where society invests its money gives an idea of its priorities. And since the amphitheater was the primary location for the gladiator games, it's fair to say that public slaughter was an important part of Roman culture. Um, gladiator shows were held from dawn to dusk. Uh, their main features were the contest to the death between the trained fighters, these gladiators. Uh, most, most of them were slaves or condemned criminals, although you did see some free men that were lured by the hope of popularity and patronage by wealthy fans, and they would participate voluntarily. Um, they went to special gladiator schools and trained for combat. Um, gladiator games also included other forms of entertainments as well. Um, criminals of all ages and both sexes were sent into the arena without weapons to face certain death from wild animals and in some cases ain't gladiators uh, but um, usually with the animals they didn't feed them for a few days so uh, the poor souls would be t they'd be torn to pieces and then it would be murderers uh, also considered criminals who would be Christians um, they were because they were considered um, atheists uh, the Christians that they um, didn't worship the multiple gods that the other Romans did the Christians only worshiped one um, Numerous kinds of animal contests were also held. Uh, wild animals would fight each other like bears against buffalo or they would stage hunts with men shooting uh, safely behind uh, from behind iron bars. Um, gladiators too in the arena would fight bulls, tigers, and lions. Reportedly uh, 5,000 beasts were killed in one day uh, of games when the Emperor Titus inaugurated the Colosseum in 80 CE. Enormous resources were invested in capturing and shipping wild animals for slaughter. Um, these bloodthirsty spectacles, they were highly popular with the Roman people. You know, they're blood sports. Um, and gladiator games, they served a purpose beyond mere entertainment. Um, the gladiator games, uh, as well as other forms of public entertainment, fulfilled both a political and social function. Um, certainly the game served to divert the idle masses and it's the the majority of the population the poor they don't have any kind of political voice uh, and that's one thing why the emperors and high-ranking officials they sponsor these games is to keep the mob the Roman mob entertain divert them keep them occupied we're going to give them free grain as well this is all part of bread and circuses uh, so they don't get hungry uh, because when people get hungry that's a possibility for a revolt so um, these emperors they went along with these um, and uh, and it it kept the Roman people from revolting. It, that The mob would have been extremely difficult to try to control within Rome and with the confines of the city.